Welcome to Becoming a Writer. This is my YouTube channel where I share about my writing journey and also uh, introduce you to some great writers and also some uh, awesome resources that can help inspire your writing career. Uh, I'm so excited today to have with us uh, Donovan Neal, who I met uh, online, just uh, seen some of his works and so forth. And he's with us today to share about uh, himself, how he got right, how he got started writing, and kind of where he's at right now. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Donovan. Can you uh, please tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself and how you got started writing? Well, thanks, Thomas. Nice to um, be with you. Pleasure is definitely mine. Um, again, forgiveness for the, the little the lighting issues here. So I'm doing the best we can here, but. Uh, to answer your question, basically, I got started writing. Um, the first thing I wrote was a 100-page novel, um, and that was back in during a creative um, writing class in high school many, many years ago in the 80s, and um, just putting together just a, just a final exam and started that creating writing novel. That was, again, when I was a teenager. I uh, got an A on that, on that exam, and it was a, a science fiction type of um, uh, book was like a, a mashup of um, Battlefield Earth, if you're familiar with that, um, Dune and Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> so, but my little hundred um, page um, creative writing project. So got that. And basically, I didn't pick up um, my writing pen again until I was well into my 40s, 30s, late 40s, late 30s. Uh, mid 40s so um, picked that up again and um, just started reading I had a story idea in mind that I wanted to um, see come to fruition and uh, that's pretty much how things started I just wrote a little bit at a time during periods of time that I, I had the time um, times during unemployment um, and just sat down in what they call button chair and uh, allowed the, the story to, to come forth. So that's pretty much how I, I kind of got started. Definitely wasn't purposeful. Uh, I can't say I planned to be a writer. Um, now I'm definitely more um, structured and um, more um, conscientious about what I'm doing and, 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 and whatnot, but definitely didn't start that way. <laughs> okay. So I know you wrote the series uh, Third Heaven, and uh, it's got four books so far. Can you tell us a little bit about that series and also what inspired you to write it? Well, the Third Heaven series is a four book um, speculative Christian fiction series about the fall of Lucifer. Um, it covers from before the existence of mankind up until uh, really the final judgment of um, of mankind and specifically Lucifer, who's the main character. Um, so the book starts off with him being literally in the lake of fire. He's already been judged. He's already been, um, again, cast into the lake of fire and his angelic brother Michael is kind of standing far off, kind of looking at this situation. And he's realizing he's about to see um, this spectacle of the lake of fire and those that have been judged and specifically his brother now thrown in it after all these millions of years, and he's kind of reminiscing, and he's just asking himself the question, how did we get to this point where you are on one side of judgment and I'm on the other side of the judgment? So the four book series is essentially a flashback of how they came to these two, these two angelic brothers have come to these two, to this, this disparate place where one's on one side of Lake of Fire and the other one's not on the other side. And so um, it starts off um, basically essentially with creation just like that. So book one um, deals with the actual fall of Lucifer itself, the um, proverbial war in heaven, um, and how that all went about. And again, everything's fictional. Um, I, I'm the first person to ever say, um, you know, I, tell, I jokingly tell people I was not there. I don't have any kind <laughs> of firsthand knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a story. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, put your rocks down. Um, it's just designed to be a fun field, uh, kind of like an action adventure story along the lines of Lord of the Rings. 
and okay. taking a, our biblical story and using just basically creative license. Uh, I've tried to be true to uh, what the scripture has said about some things, but I've also tried to just tell a, tell a story. And so sometimes those things are congruent with theology or scripture, and sometimes they're not. And like I said, so I didn't write the book to be a treatise, a doctrinal treatise um, that someone can prescriptively use and say, hey, you know, that, that is not, not the case at all. It's just meant to be a fun story that as you read along in the four books will actually make you think a lot about not just, you know, our Bible and the invisible world of angels and how we interact with them, but also, you know, if you're an unbeliever, if it's a person who's an unbeliever, you know, might even potentially lead them to Christ. And so, um, so yeah, so book one, by the time you get to the end of book one, you are at the just before the fall of Adam and Eve. And you literally, when you're at the end of book one, you're like, oh my gosh, I know what's going to happen next. Because especially if you're Christian, you know about the fall. Um, so it, it kind of really leads directly into that. So book two is called The Birth of God. And it deals with the time from the fall of Adam and Eve up until the birth of Christ, thus the play on the word, the birth of God. And so it deals with a lot of the stuff that happens in the Old Testament. And essentially, how do um, the angels, the book, the angels are the central characters in the book, not human beings. And so the, the series addresses how do biblical events and things like that look from their vantage point, um, how they look at things. Um, so that's book two. Book, book three is called The Realm of the Dead. And that book specifically deals with the years that Jesus was on the earth and specifically those three days that he was dead and in the grave. What was going on then? Where did he go? Um, where did he resurrect from? And the Bible talks about, um, you know, Jesus made an open show of them, them referring to the demonic host, um, those individuals who were antagonistic towards him. You know, what does that mean? Um, Peter talks about he preached to the spirits in prison. What, what was all going on there? And so, again, I just take creative license to imagine um, what that was like. Um, and so that book deals with those, again, those three days and, and that time frame when Jesus walked earth and ends with his resurrection um, um, and his ascent into heaven. Um, book four, called The uh, Apocalypse of Kings, is a book that's now we're in um, our future, um, past the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> We are now looking at the time of the Antichrist. We're looking at the Battle of Armageddon. We're looking at the resolution of all things. Um, and so by the time you get to the end of book four, you're back to where you began in book one with Michael and Lucifer, again, about to part ways. Um, because again, these two brothers are, are central in the stories of the entire, entire book in terms of how they got to this place. And so I kind of liken it sometimes if you remember or had the opportunity to watch um, The Prince of Egypt, um, which was an animated cartoon about the, um, the crossing of the Red Sea and everyone like that. And so that, that series, that animated movie really saw, showed a lot about the, the, the brotherhood relationship between Ramesses and Moses. And um, I tried to replicate that on some way as relates to Michael and Lucifer in terms of the divergent paths that they took and the outcomes for that. So um, in the series, I'm dealing with questions that, you know, angelic mortality, um, the Bible talks about angels having weapons. And so it's like, wow, why do angels have weapons? You know, well, you know, is heaven in the manufacturing, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the business of manufacturing weapons? You know, uh, and if that's the case and angels having weapons that, you know, ergo means that they, they're using them and that means they can be hurt in some way. That's the whole purpose of a weapon, a sword. Um, so just dealing with the whole issue in terms of some of these things we really don't think about in terms of what the Bible really says. Um, we just kind of gloss over things or we just read them so fast. We really don't think, we don't, really don't plumb the depths of what the scriptures are trying to tell us. And so... Again, the whole four book series is just my Lord of the Rings-esque attempt mm -hmm. to um, put this epic story, because I think the fall of Lucifer is the precursor to um, things that we see in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, he's in, you know, he's in the garden <laughs> at the very beginning of the fall. He's the protagonist, or the antagonist, as it were, 
um, to why, you know, Eve did what she did. So he's already there at mm -hmm. the very beginning. And so, um, so I try to answer questions. Um, why is he there? What could he have said um, that might have caused a third of the angels to have to be cast out of heaven? Uh, what did he do? Um, what was the timeline? And again, you know, all this is fictional, all this is speculative, and I emphasize the speculative nature of it. And it's not meant to be prescriptive, but it is designed to kind of open our minds a little bit more and ask questions that we might not normally ask and uh, try to put a narrative on some things in such a way as to make it fun reading. So I hope I accomplished that. Um, sales have been great, so I think I did a good job of people buying the book. <laughs> so I figured that the cash, you know, people buying your book is the, is the it lets you know that things must be doing okay if you want to read the story. So uh, now you asked about what, what kind of prompted that story or what kind of inspired me to do it. Right. And uh, essentially, I had always, my grandmother used to talk about angels uh, all the time. And uh, God bless her. And, you know, someday when it, someday, uh, at some point in time when I was a kid, it must have been around seven years old or so, you know, she started talking to me about the fall of Lucifer. And so um, angels and, you know, and I was always an inquisitive kid, you know, why did God do X, Y, and Z? And, da, 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 da. and so she tried to answer it these simple Bible questions. And that's when I discovered, okay, well, it was this angel called Lucifer. He fell, got through a mile, but he did some bad things. And so, um, so now I'm an adult, you know, uh, you go into the ministry and you, now you see these things and you have these doctrinal questions and angelology and a lot of the scriptures. And so, um, so I blame it on my grandma, you know, <laughs> <laughs> grandma. <laughs> well, I blame it on grandma. But uh, no, I just really wanted to, I think Toni Morris was the one that said, if you wanted to, if there's, if there's a story that you want to tell and, 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 and no one's basically written it, you know, you need to tell it yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I saw, the, the devil that's described in the Bible is a powerful um, person who had the ability to show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in the twinkling of an eye. Mm -hmm. um, he is someone that the Bible warns us against. Um, we're not to take him lightly. He's a defeated foe already, but yet at the same time, um, he's not to be trifled with, you know. Um, and so when I see the depictions, when I saw at the times that I started writing this book, the depictions of the devil, I always saw him as a caricature in Hollywood and in fictional depictions as a little red guy that stands on your shoulder and tells you, the bad stuff to do to encourage you to tempt you right. but he's never spoken as the thief that comes to steal kill and destroy um I, i've never seen him he's a he's a buffy the vampire like caricature um right. and everything i had i had seen um i think the only time i saw the devil or, or demons or anything like that or angels taken seriously was in like really horror flicks um like the like the omen uh, what's the one with the girl who had the twist of the head? That kind of, I forget the name of that movie. But, um, Poltergeist? Uh, not Poltergeist, um, but the one where the girl was possessed. And that was based off a true, kind of a true story. And the Catholic priest came in and had to um, um, basically, you know, she was demon possessed and he had to do an exorc exorcism. The exorcist. So oh, yeah. movies like that, it seems like the horror genre did more justice to the seriousness and the darkness that the Bible was talking about than I see on, that I saw in typical Hollywood. And uh, the Passion of the Christ is to me a wonderful uh, depiction. I love the current series that's out by Dallas Jenkins called The Chosen. Um, so, but what inspired me was the desire to really tell this story about the fall of Lucifer because quite frankly, I had not seen anything out there in, in media that re remotely addressed that. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it was one of the most epic stories, um, the betrayal of, you know, the first betrayal. Mm -hmm. So in my audacity and my marketing for the Third Heaven series, I, I call my series the prequel to the Bible, not in a sac, not, not to be in a sac yeah. yeah, not to be that's in a pretty, sacrilegious. That's pretty provocative. <laughs> <laughs> and it was designed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah, designed yeah. to be. Um, because I saw that story the fall of Lucifer as the prequel to events, as we understand prequels, 
mm -hmm. um, to what happened in the garden. So um, that was kind of all that motivation to bring that story to life. And I wanted to bring it to life in such a way as if I was to see the story on the big screen, how would I want to see it? You know, I, I want to see the epic battles of, of angels that said, we're not doing this, we're, you know. And so that's kind of what inspired me to do. And so, you know, it took me seven years to write that first book. Hmm. And after seven years, I was like, wow, you know, I, I like what I'm seeing. And um, I didn't intend to really put it up there so much for other people. I've already wrote it for myself, um, never thinking um, that other individuals will really enjoy the story. Um, I, I don't know, vanity, call it vanity if you will, but I just wrote it really for myself to read and um, just had, I just happened to write the book at the time that Amazon um was first putting out really kdp or kindle and so i think i was three years after they had already established um the kindle format and so um when ebooks came out and so i just happened to write my book at a time that stories could be published by someone like me and available to a wide audience without having to go through a traditional publisher mm -hmm. so that's pretty much how things happened and uh, kind of what the motivation was uh, for the book that's great. So I think a lot of people have, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas of uh, writing a book one day. And the, the uh, there's many aspects to that. But I think coming up with an idea is very easy, I think. But then after that, structuring it in such a way that you have an entire book. So my question to you is, I know we spoke a little bit earlier, uh, a few days ago, and you mentioned the Pixar story structure, and also the snowflake method which yeah. are some ways that people can use to once they have like a germ of an idea to build it mm -hmm. out something that can be a book can you talk about mm -hmm. both of those and how they've helped you well uh, when i wrote out my um first book i utilized the snowflake method and if you look at a snowflake a snowflake is actually a very complicated um thing um it's crystal and syrup there's no snow two snowflakes that exist <laughs> that we at least that that we're aware of that are identical, and they're very complicated structures. And so the gentleman who wrote the Snowflake Method, uh, anyone can Google that and you find a book on Amazon. Um, um, he talked about that, and he talked about how you could take that complexity and break it down into something simple. What I found with the Pixar story structure is that they essentially did the same thing. And so the Pixar story structure, I think, is just simpler and easier to understand than the snowflake method. But I think they're really one and the same. And they're just basically taking something that is simple and then expanding on that until you have something that is far more complex. Um, so the Pixar story structure really just asks, uh, really is just really simple. And uh, it just basically says, once upon a time, there was blank. Mm -hmm. Every day, blank. And then one day, <laughs> blank. And because of that, and then because of that, until finally. So that's really your story. And when you think about it, um, the snowflake method is essentially just like that, too. Um, it starts off that. And then what you're doing with the blanks is you're just extrapolating on that. So when I think of your, your story is really broken down into that, that smallest piece of that Pixar story structure there. Um, and so you're answering those questions and then you're taking each one of those sentences and then you're expanding it. Eventually what happens is that you have an outline that allows you to um, you know, work with, manipulate and say, hey, this is my story. Um, this is what fits. This doesn't. This does not fit. Um, but it starts off as simple as that, and then you just keep adding to it. So, um, you know, I'm not. My, I'm not that much of a, a cook. Uh, my wife would probably joke and say that I could burn water. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? I can make. I can make a mean chocolate chip cookie, and you know, 
writing is no different than baking in that, in that respect in the sense that you just don't put all that stuff together and just come up with a nice cookie. Um, you have to get the chocolate chips, you got to get your flour, you got to get your sugar, your brown. So there's elements. Sure. And then you just have to get the right combination of the elements together, mix them up in a certain way, and then allow things to quote unquote bake for a certain period of time. And then after that period of time, you have this end product. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, writing is no different in that, that regard, trying to use just analogies that, that people can think about. But um, so writing is just really about what is your story? Um, what's your beginning, your middle, and your end? The middle is typically the hardest to write. Mm -hmm. um, I always try to think of the end in mind, like where do I want to be? Um, I think of um, I think of like the formation of a planet. Um, so you know what happens there in the formation of the planet? You got your dust, you got your gases, they're swirling around. And so what I do is I like to grasp onto um, music, songs. I really like epic music. Sometimes a particular song can create a certain mood. And I find that I want to capture that mood that that song is creating in my book. Okay. And so uh, I might hear a particular piece of music. And if you think about it, um, uh, um, you've got certain themes. Um, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. <laughs> and then you automatically think James Bond. Right. You know, um, you think of other songs that like that, they evoke certain types of things within you. And so I listen to, I listen, I ask myself, what is the story? And then what's the emotion that I want to put into this story? So I've got the story, I got my pot. And I also listen to the music, um, epic songs. And you just go on YouTube and, and do all kind of epic songs. And I think, okay, well, what kind of feelings, emotions, from the music that I'm listening to, do I want to evoke in the book? And so that goes in there. Mm -hmm. And then I think about different images. So I might go to Pinterest, I might go to Google, different places. I think about different images in the story and they're the colors or the scenery. And then that goes in the story because the images evoke certain things that I want to bring out in the book. Mm -hmm. So I don't start off having it all together. What I do is I pull from different places. And I mix a little bit here, mix a little bit there. And so what happens, I begin to get the raw cookie dough. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and then after that, then it's just a matter of putting in a structured way to create that final product. And so I use a three-act structure um, to, um, you know, you work with my stories. Um, some people think about pinch points. I don't want to get too much in the jargon. Um, but they expand on that three X structure. So by three X structure, I just mean you got a beginning, middle, and end. Um, and <laughs> there are just a lot of resources out there that can help with um, all those different things. I think about the plotting. Um, the plotting deals with you know kind of the pace of the book too. Um, I'm a video game player, um, and so I think of what when I'm playing a video game, the classic video games always had boss endings. Mm -hmm. And um, you fight the boss at the, the, the big bad boss, you know, at the end of the game. And then before that, you might have these mini bosses. And mm -hmm. you have what they call these mid-level bosses. And so I think about that in terms of my writing. When is the big boss coming into play? So mm -hmm. when I think I'm thinking, I'm usually writing action, adventure, fantasy, so I'm thinking in those terms, but if you were to translate this into different other types of genres like romance or something else, the question is, when does your major events come into play? What is your, what is your boss event? Okay, right. what's that? What's the equivalent for you in that genre? Uh, and you just figure out where that's coming. And that helps you, um, you know, I know we both live in Michigan. I know south of us is the Cedar Point Park. And I love roller coasters. And in every roller coasters, you have your major hill that you get up and then you, you go down. Usually it's the first one. And that hill provides enough momentum to carry you through the rest of the, the ride. And, um, but there's more than one hill because you've got to have more than one event in your story to help want to continue the reader to want to keep reading. 
And so what's important to you as an author is not always what's important to your audience. And so you have to think about it from the standpoint, sometimes like even a video trailer. Um, you know, some video trailers give the whole story away. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then other trailers is like, wow, they're enticing enough. They don't give the whole story away, but they give enough of that you want to read it. And so I tried to think of my stories in terms of each section of the story is just a small trailer. And I'm just adding trailer after trailer after trailer after trailer. So by the year, you want to keep reading. You don't want to put the hook down. And so one of the things that I do is put hooks at the ends of my scenes um, that makes the, the reader wondering, like, what happens? And so the scene usually is not completed uh, or I have a, an idea in terms of, um, of, of a particular scene. And so I want to draw you into the next scene. So maybe the way I draw you into the next scene is not by immediately starting off from where that left off. I now might just now put you in this new place. And so authors use those little tricks. And so you can see the same thing in movies um, because script writing and novel writing are very similar in, in a lot yeah. of regards. So, um, and so you see these things happen in, in movies as well. And I don't want to, you know, just talk and talk about, cause I love writing, so I can talk about writing. <laughs> uh, we'll be talking some more, that's for sure. <laughs> so um, I know you have a full-time job. And you write, you also write, uh, you are a writer, I would say. So I just want to know how you balance uh, both things. And then I guess, would you say you're a binge writer or you're someone that writes every day or every few days? Or can you just tell us about how you do your process? Um, I would not say, <clears throat> I, I think it, I never heard, I, ha I haven't heard the term of binge writing, but there's a truth to that. Um, there are some writers that write consistently every day, and I try to do that because I find that if I do that, then I get stuff done. Um, but there are definitely times when I write more on a particular day than others. So I always have a goal, and it's a modest goal in my mind, of writing a thousand words a day. And so I know writers that can write 3,000, 5,000 words a day. Um, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can. I find I can do that if I have a really tight story. But I find a lot of times with me, it's like driving in a car in the dark with the headlights on, and you can only see a little bit ahead of you. Sure. Uh, and so I don't know where to go. And so that it's not that I can't write those words down. It's that I can't. I don't have the scene enough in my head to be able to describe what's happening. And so I find I have to go back and figure out more where I want to go because I've hit it kind of like a dead end. Um, so it's not the act of typing out content that's the problem for me, it's the, it's the act of what is it that, what is the story that I want to tell? And so that takes more time sometimes um, figuring that out um, because sometimes I'm a pantser and then sometimes I have like it really laid out sure. in terms of my outline. So, um, so I try to write, like I said, write, you know, write consistently, but there are definitely days when I write far more than, than others. So I've got a 40 hour job, like you mentioned. So where do I write? I basically write um, in between when I have breaks. Uh, I definitely take some time, usually in the evening after I get home from work um, to write. Um, sometimes if I have some time at my job, I'll write. Um, I will use my phone to record scenes. You know, I'll be in my okay. car. Excuse me, I'll be in my car and an idea for a scene will come to me and I can't write it down right then. I'll just speak the speak it into my phone mm -hmm. and record it in my phone and then come back to it later. So I find that I'm writing all the time or thinking about writing or trying to create thinking about the story all the time. I just might not actually be at the typewriter or excuse me, the keyboard pecking out actual words. Mm -hmm. And I find that if I if I think like that, I personally I get discouraged because like oh man I need a thousand words today. Um, I didn't get as much content done, but I got a lot of outlining done that I know will allow me to go ahead and write what I need to write. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how it's how it's been for me. Um, but I'm trying to do a better job. I always tell people you know everybody's journey is different. Um, everybody's journey up the mountain is definitely different. So you got to write the way that best works for you. And mm -hmm. so for some people, that's just simply they crank out a certain amount. It's like a job. Um, I can do that if I've got a really good idea of what I'm doing. Sometimes I can't do that. And so I need to put that book down 
and then I need to go work on something else. So I've recently gotten like that a little bit too, where it's like, I'm just kind of tired of this story. I've been in this universe. I was definitely that way by the time I, I got to the end of book four. I was just tired <laughs> of writing about these characters, writing about the world. And I was kind of like, I didn't feel like I had anything more. And I had to like step away from things. Um, but I knew there were more stories. I just wasn't sure necessarily how to, how to tell them. Um, and then I, did I want to tell them? And then could I tell them in such a way as to really make a, a novel? It was really the question. I might have had something I could say in, in 20,000 words, but not necessarily 100. And so... Um, Are most of your novels 100,000, like in the, the, uh, the Third Heaven series? Yeah, all four books are roughly 100,000 words, okay. uh, maybe a tiny bit less or a tiny bit more. But that was what uh, I felt that 100,000 words is what I needed to tell the story. Um, I think the fourth, the last book, the fourth book in the series was actually probably maybe needed to be a little longer. Um, but I tried, because originally it was going to be a five book series. And so I tried to deal with stuff um, I, I look at things in terms from a dispensationalist viewpoint for, for Christians out there. So, um, you know, millennialism, uh, if you think about that. So I was thinking about writing a series um, that dealt with our modern day time. And then after that modern day time, like um, the great white throne judgment up until um, judgment. Um, so or the, the, the millennial years, the thousand year reign and stuff like that. So I didn't touch that. I didn't touch that segment of, of, the, of the story that the Bible tells us was going to happen. Jesus' thousand years reign on earth. And so I didn't touch that story. Um, I could have, but I, didn't, I felt that it would have taken me too far from where I was really trying to go. And really the story, again, was about, it was about Lucifer's fall and um, that he's an object lesson for us as Christians, um, a tragic character, if you think about it. Um, but in some respects, and I've had people tell me that we're all, we all could be Lucifer <laughs> if we're not careful. Um, because it's not like he started off in this position. Uh, he was definitely in an idyllic situation. He was literally with God. He was literally in an ideal environment. Right. He had no lack, no resources, and yet he still failed. And so, um, to me, some of the applications or some of the, as they say, the moral of the story is, you know, take heed to yourselves, lest, you know, you fall as well. And so, uh, so I tried to make Lucifer a character that people could understand. Um, and uh, so this was not to make him sympathetic, but to understand when you're telling a story, the villain in the story usually doesn't conceive of themselves of a villain. Right. And so... Um, having to try to balance what the story demanded versus what's in the Bible and trying to do my best to merge those things and not really trying to turn people off, which I know in some cases I did. Um, just really trying to be respectful to you know, sacred texts. And yet at the same time, as a creative writer, as an artist, as a creative artist, understanding that there's a story here and just trying to be true to the story that, that's wanting to be told. And so, so it was definitely a challenge to, to do that. But yeah, writing is button chair stuff. You know, you got to oh, put yeah. your button yeah. chair. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> well, you won't get anything done. <laughs> true, very true, very true. Or uh, record as you're walking or whatever, but you got to get it done. So yes. Got to get it done. So you just keep doing a little bit at a time. Um, I word count. So um now I've, I've learned not to get so caught up in 100,000 words of, of stuff. Um, so now I'm, I try to write shorter novels, actually, now. So now I'm trying to write things in a 50,000 word range. And then I ask my, once, if, if I get to that, which I, usually, which I will, I have never not gotten to that. Then the question becomes, okay, well, how much larger does the story need to be? You know, um, because I don't want to just get into in the fluff. I want to tell the story. Uh, I want the pacing to be good. You know, the watch the movie is like, okay, it was a great movie, but it was too long. They didn't have to do all of that. Right. <laughs> and so I don't want that experience uh, for my reader and my books where, you know, you've got this hundred thousand word tone 
and uh, or longer, you know, if you like J.R. You know, J.R. Martin, he writes it's huge or, or but um, you know, you tell the story that needs to be told in in the amount of time and words that it needs to be told, and mm -hmm. kind of go from there. Okay. So I know it's been uh, quite a few years since you got started, but what advice would you have for uh, new writers that are trying to get started? Uh, Take your time. Don't um, learn. Learn how to write, because there's there's two there's three parts to being uh, on, if you really want to be an author. So there's writers and there's authors, and to me the the two are not the same. You're not an author until you put a put a product out that people can buy. That's when you're an author. Until then, you're a writer. You might have I don't care how much you've written, you're not an author yet <laughs> until you put it out there so that somebody can criticize it pay cash for it, then you are an author, okay. okay? There's a lot of people that write, but they're not authors. You know, bloggers write, you know? There's a lot of people that write, journalists write, but they're not authors. So, um, so my advice would be is number one, finish the book. Yeah. <laughs> finish the book, get the book finished. Um, and so, learn the prospects or learn the, the, the things that are necessary um, in writing a book. So understand your structure, understand outlines. Are you a pantser? You write by the seat of your pants, because that's what that means. And I didn't know that when I first started. <laughs> or you're what they call a plotter. You like detailed notes of what's going to happen. And this is the result of this and da, 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 da. Uh, some people use Excel. I've seen people use Google sheets um i think rk Rowland. i think she had sticky notes i've seen people use sticky notes they write it in journals whatever works for you yeah. um you need to have a method of understanding who are your characters and things like that and what do they do so understand the authorship um part of the business so how to how write you know understand your grammar um here's another tip too don't worry about how it get the story out first and then go back and edit it. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing. Um, and I know I've been guilty of this. I write the story and then I'm going back and I'm editing as I go. And I've learned that that slows down the writing process. It slows down when you're in that zone, when the mm -hmm. images and the creative ideas are coming, you just need to just get them out. And so I'll do things like I might not know the name of the character. I'll just put like XXX you know, or some other moniker that lets me know, okay, I need to go back and fill this in. But right. I've got the kernel, the basis of what I want to have in that story. So get the story out and don't, you know, writing a story is different than editing a story. Get the story out first. That would be, that would probably be the biggest piece of advice. The second thing is once the story is done, uh, you become essentially a, a publisher. And um, you got you have a product out, and so you got to learn how to, um, if you want people to see it. Now, if you don't want people to see it or buy it, that's a different issue. But if you're writing a story with the intent of the story is to have other people read it, then you need to understand the publishing market and mm -hmm. what's available, how to do that, and things like that. So study that, and then finally uh, understand that um, once you actually put your book out to publish you become an entrepreneur you are a business person whether you want it to be or not and so you need to understand that aspect of things in terms of what's required to um, operate your business and do so successfully so um, so those would be some of the initial things button chair um, write the story don't worry about editing just write it for yourself don't write it for write it for yourself don't write it for other people um, just write it, write it for yourself in terms of how it's how it's going to get done, and and uh, have fun at it. You know, have fun at it. Um, don't. Yes, it can be work. It can be laborious work, trudgery. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it can be really, really fun. Um, I think I read sometime one. If you get if you get stuck so, at some place, kill off a character. You know. <laughs> Uh, George R. R. Martin. <laughs> Kill off a care. You know, surprisingly, that's a, that really works sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, blow uh, something up, yeah. Yeah, blow something up. Kill, you know, bring something in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some monotony of it. <laughs> okay. 
I think I've also heard people say that you can skip around. You don't necessarily have to write in chronological order. You, so exactly. If you get stuck at one point, you know, go to another scene that works and then keep piecing it together. And then you can eventually stitch it all together. So Yeah, that's exactly what I did for my first book. I actually had the very last scene wrote before I did anything else. Uh, I had the very last scene of the book. I knew how the book was supposed to end. Uh, I wrote the story, and that's the, what, what's the, the prologue that's in my book is the first thing that I wrote before I had how, they, how those two angels got to that point. I just, that was the kernel. That was the scene right. of everything, the, the prologue that I have in that first book. And it's only a couple pages long. And um, then the question becomes, like, you, then you're back into it. So that definitely got, a, got to a particular point. Uh, so you really bring up a really excellent point. Sometimes you get bogged down, write the fun stuff. So you might have not have gotten to the scene that you want to write. It's not chronologically where you are at yet, but write it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, and you will find that sometimes in doing that, it will release the fog that's there, and then it'll give you a better idea as to how you get to that point. You know, or it might totally change the direction of what you want to do. But just write the scene. Sometimes you just gotta. You don't know what's in you. You just have to write it, and then it just comes out. It just bubbles out, and it's not based on an outline, um, and it's not even based on you just freehand just pantsing. It's based on you just skipping around in a story, and you realize, oh, this ties into that, and then you just begin to make those connections. Next thing you know, you've you've got you've, you've finished your book. <laughs> right, right, right. So, speaking of books, do you have any books you can recommend for new writers? that they can, uh, you know, like resources, this kind of a thing? Um, there, are, there are a ton of books, but there are only a couple that, um, there's so many books out there, but there's, there's a few great books that I really recommend that are like, I, I'll call them classics um, in my mind. And I wanna go to my website real quick, and, cause I actually, excuse me, put these on, uh, my website for people to to look at because I do highly recommend them and um, these books are um, Ape is what it's called A-P-E and it's called um, Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur, How to Publish a Book and it's that's written by uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one um, That's definitely a book that I recommend because I think it gives you an overall holistic picture of the of the business um, if you're looking at in terms of how to actually write, then Plot and Structure is a great book um, by James Scott Bell. Yep. Highly recommend that book. Um, that's a classic. That's one of the first books I, I read about writing. What's it called? What's the one you're referring to by Scott Bell? Um, Scott Bell, Plot and Structure. Plot and Structure, okay. Mm -hmm. Plot and Structure. Uh, another great book that's out there is called um, Write Your Novel from the Middle, also by James Scott Bell. And I found that that really helps me um, because sometimes you get stuck in the middle of a book sometimes is where you get stuck at. And so understanding what's going on in the center of your book really can help you to get over the hurdle. And mm -hmm. so... Um, you know, Scott Bell is just an, a wonderful author and has just great material out there. So he's definitely one of my authors that I recommend. Um, the Emotion Thesaurus. Okay, yeah, is, uh, Lucy or Becca, I think. Yep, okay. that's, a, that's a great book as well um, by Angela um, Ackerman. Um, that's, a, that's a great book. Um, and then finally, um, and again, these are just a few. I mean, I, I could give you titles after titles, but story structure basics, how to write books, how to write better books by learning from the movies, screenwriting tricks for authors. And that's by Alexandra um, Sokolov. Okay. Uh, so those are great books. And so that helped me because I'm such a visual person. Yeah. Uh, and I love movies. And since I have this, this back catalog of movies in my head, it was really easy for me to um, make the connections between um, writing and um, the production and producing of these movies. So those are some some basic kind of writing books 
that I recommend. They're not, they're not the only ones, but I think they're good books that uh, individuals who are looking to uh, improve uh, can definitely kind of dig into and uh, kind of go from there. Those, those would be some of my initial recommendations for sure. Okay, I'll include them in the uh, show notes. Uh, last question as we wrap it up here. Uh, where can we find out more about you and uh, what you're working on next? So my website is um, donovanemneal.com. And um, that is my primary platform that I use to communicate with the audience. And so from that platform, from my website, people can um, sign up for my newsletter. They can check me out on Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Um, but my, my, I tend to have most of my presence either on my Facebook page or my um, uh, my website. And then of course, individuals who sign up for my newsletter, they, they get all the insights. And so they know what's coming out next. Um, they're able to ask me questions. And if they, if you like me on Facebook, on my Facebook page, and that's at Donovan and Neil uh, on Facebook, um, you can go there too. And I, I love questions for from individuals. But yep, that's where people can find. I try to keep a calendar of events of things that are coming up, especially personal appearances. But obviously, with the pandemic, uh, we're all kind of kind of hunkered down right now, so uh, everything is is in flux. So I'm adjusting to the to the to the virtual realm now because <laughs> yeah. I like making tours in in Michigan at the libraries, and so uh, I really enjoy that a lot. So we'll hopefully we'll get back to that soon. But hey, that's where people can find me, DonovanInDeal.com. So, well, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we definitely, you and I will be getting definitely some more time as I'm uh, on my journey and you're obviously continuing on yours. Uh, for those of you obviously that stuck around to the end, definitely appreciate that. Click like if you love the episode and also consider subscribing to the channel. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.